So what time is it on this cycle of ages? The most common cons consensus is that we're in the Kali Yuga or that we're in the beginning stages of the, dis of the ascending Dvarpara Yuga. Traditionalist Vedic scholars who subscribe to the 12,000 divine year theory say that the Kali Yuga began in 3102 BC when Krishna left earth at the end of the war during the Mahabharata. This initiated the Kali Yuga. And according to the divine year model, remember where one year of the gods is 360 human years. So the divine year theory makes the Kali Yuga, four, we still have 426,000 years to go if Krishna began the Kali Yuga at 3000 BC. So the traditional 12,000 divine year model says that there's still another 400,000 years to go in Kali Yuga. And that's an extremely daunting prospect. Um, and many people contest that idea. Was there a mistranslation during the copying down or was there a deliberate falsification of this material during Kali Yuga that gives us these massive time scales that just don't seem to resonate all of our history that we know of it today is war, violence, uh, brutality. It seems that we've been, yes, we've been living in Kali Yuga, but to still have this much time left to go, it's, it's extremely intimidating to say the least. But fortunately, Sri Yukteswar in the Holy Science in his book said that the Kali Yuga, uh, it, we aren't dealing with this 12,000 year divine, divine year theory. He said that the Kali Yuga ended in 1700 AD and that we are now in the ascending Dvarpara Yuga, which makes the year 2022, 322 Dvarpara Yuga. Interesting, he says we're no longer in Kali Yuga. This is a photo of Sri Yukteswar. And he was actually the guru of uh, Yogananda, who is credited with bringing uh, yogic uh, science to Western societies with his book, An Autobiography of a Yogi. Yogananda, his guru was Sri Yukteswar. So Sri Yukteswar takes the procession of the equinoxes and he combines that with the cycle of ages. So as a review, the equinox is the 24 hour period of equal day and night that happens twice a year on or around March 21st in the spring as a spring equinox and the autumn equinox on or around September 21st. It's not always on that calendar date, September 21st, March 21st, because of the Gregorian calendar and the misalignment, as you can see again, not exact calculation. So it could happen a few days before or after, and each year it slightly changes. But observably, the sun's exact zodiacal position on the eastern horizon, on the dawn of that day of the equinox, where the sun is in the zodiac, is 50.29 arc seconds behind its exact position on that day from the previous year. So the zodiac is slightly moving 50.29 arc seconds per year based on the date, the position of the sun on that equal day and night. So the zodiac belt of 12 signs pro processing backwards, it's the sidereal zodiac. And so this is the most uh, common way to, to judge the position of the zodiac in India. It's the astrological calculation. So the sidereal zodiac is based on this slightly moving backwards each year. The zodiac that does, that does not calculate this procession, where every year the equinox is at 0, point, 0 degrees 0 minutes Aries, is called the tropical zodiac. So these are the two different main zodiacs. So Sri Yukteswar used the procession of the equinoxes through the zodiacal signs to mark the changing of the cycle of ages. And so the, he was saying that the autumn equinox is the sign of the age and the Western astrologers use the spring equinox as the sign of the age. And the, when the autumn equinox is at zero degrees, zero minutes Aries, this is the top of the, of the Satya Yuga and the beginning of the descending cycle. So here, the graph that shows in what we're talking about here, how they're combined. First, we have the same portions, the Satya Yuga being here. 
and then silver, uh, copper, uh, the, and then Kali Yuga Dark Age. It's the same as the ones we've been previously looking at on the outer ring. The inner ring are the zodiac signs. The zodiac signs progress from Aries to Taurus to Gemini, Cancer, in that direction. That's how the sun moves through each of these signs every month. And this is the this is zero degrees Aries, and then this is 29, 30 degrees Aries, and then one degree Taurus, and so on. But the procession of the equinox is working backwards. So when the, when the autumn equinox is right here in zero degrees Aries, we're at the top of the golden age. And then gradually it's moving backwards, so it moves backwards. And so gradually as the golden age continues, the, the, the position of the sun on the equinox is in this degrees all the way down. Today, the, the autumn equinox is in around five degrees Virgo, moving backwards, roughly. We'll get to it in a second. So this is where we are according to this procession map, which aligned with the Yuga map puts us outside of Kali Yuga according to those calculations. This is Sri Yukteswar's model that he presented. You can see the ascending side, 12,000 years, descending side, 12,000 years. This is the exact graph that he put in his book in 1894. And here is a date calendar. So he's saying, he's using the sidereal zodiac, he's using this procession to mark out the, the years. And you can see we have 500 AD, being the bottom of Kali Yuga and that that 1200 the, we have the transitions and then that 1200 years ends at 1700 AD so that the very bottom of the Kali Yuga being 500 and this uh, so that all of our I'm suggesting that our history that we know of today happens in more or less this time frame which only brings us back to 700 BC and that most of what we consider ancient history is happening in this area. Because when Krishna left the earth, it was the end of the Varpara Yuga. And I think that the, the Kali Yuga civilizations were all post 700 BC. And that here we have the, the Vedic uh, period, the predominant Vedic theory, uh, period, and then we have more advanced cultures during this time and possibly the Mori Atlantis taking place during these times. But as you can see, I'm just giving rough estimates. But this is according to, um, this is according to Sri Yukteswar's theory. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a second. And Devarpara proper beginning in 1900. So this century, the Devarpara Yuga began with a transition of 200 years of Devarpara ended. So... This puts us in, we're in the Virgo Pisces axis. So some people say we're in the age of Pisces. Well, in 2022, the autumn equinox, which is September 21st, which Sri Yukteswar uses to calculate the age, is at 5 degrees 15 minutes Virgo in the sidereal Lahiri calculation, which means we're in the age of Virgo. But in the West, we use the spring equinox. So people say we're in the age of Pisces because Virgo and Pisces are on opposite sides of the zodiac. And so when the autumn equinox happens, the sun, they're two opposite sides of the year. So when the autumn equinox happens, that's an opposite of when the spring equinox happens. So people, so this map doesn't work because if we were saying that, oh, we're living in the, the Satya Yuga, are we living in the Satya Yuga? Well, the autumn equinox is saying we're living in the Kali Yuga and that we should be using actually the autumn equinox to mark the age. So, but we can use both because both the equinoxes are important. So that means we're in the Virgo Pisces axis. It's not just the Pisces era. We're in the Virgo Pisces axis. So the qualities of both of these signs, because the equinox is landing in their signs, will be the most important. So... If we calculate it out using the procession and this theory, 
if we're in 50 degrees, 5 degrees, 15 minutes Pisces, that means the quote unquote age of Aquarius or the age of Leo Aquarius will begin in the year 2440 AD. So the idea that we're in the age of Aquarius, if we're, it all, it's all, the question is always, well, what are we judging the age of Aquarius on? What makes us in the age of Aquarius? If we're using this model, we can say that we're judging it on the procession of the equinoxes, but according to that, it won't start for another 400 years. So it's an interesting way to look at it because, again, what we need is scientific evidence. We don't want to just say, oh, I, I'm intuiting that we're in that age already. You can use your intuition, but looking for more concrete and objective proofs is a far more scientific way to go about it. Um, science isn't the end-all be-all or objective observation isn't the end-all be-all, but we don't want to be throwing terms around if we're not firm on what those terms mean, such as the term age of Aquarius. So some evidence, contextual historical evidence that we're in Devarpara Yuga, which would have began the, tran the transition out, uh, the transition into Devar the first transition into Devarpara would have been 1700. So there were two, there were humanitarian reforms and the moving away from the divine right of rulership of the monarchies throughout Europe and a focusing on developing the lower classes of society in Western Europe, Russia, and the United States. In a rush, the peasant classes being given more agency and saying that they can now own land. These pro this progress was taken underway in earnest in around the 1700s when people uh, who weren't the kings and queens were given more respect. And then we have the enlightenment philosophers of Western Europe and idealism of their scientific uh, pursuits. And there's just this, um, there's a focus on materiality and the material sciences, but you have their ideals of, of having democracy and fairness. These ideals were brought into larger consciousness of the people, at least the striving to have um, these more uh, fair and just types of societies is being introduced rather than um, saying, rather than saying, no, we're because of our blood, our bloodline, we're the rulers and we're going to rule you no matter what. Now they're saying, oh, we should give a, we should have a democracy. We should have equal and fairness amongst people, but not actually living it out to the fullest extent because the monarchies hadn't all, you know, gotten rid of themselves right away or hadn't all just said, okay, we got to do something different. It's a gradual process. So the discovery of the outer planets is another evidence of, of the possibility that we're in Devarpara Yuga. And I have a particular teacher who I asked him a question once and he, I said, what about Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto? Uh, they're not visible to the human eye. Uh, how do those work in relation to conscious or how do they work in relation to uh, past ages? How, uh, who discovered them? And he said that he read an old alchemical text that said, as consciousness expands, more planetary bodies will be discovered and more planets will be discovered. Because planets are forces within our individual consciousness as there are forces in the consciousness of the earth. And as consciousness grows, more planets will be discovered. So Uranus was first documented in the 1690s and then uh, given a name and properly attributed to one of the wandering stars of the other planets is in 1781. Neptune was documented by Galileo, but not identified as a planet itself. But in 1846 was given proper, um, it was given proper placement as one of the wandering stars and Pluto in 1930. So we're seeing the discovery of other conscious elements in our celestial environment. So this is, part, this is contextual evidence that there's an expansion of consciousness already happening because none of these planets are mentioned in the ancient Vedic texts, keep in mind. The unification of the world with electrical technology, such as lights, the telegraph, phone lines, and the internet. So the Dvarpara Yuga is the electrical age, the age of electricity. Now look all around us, electricity is being used in more sophistication year by year. And this, these weren't attributes of our lives uh, starting 
uh, into the 1800s, all, these were all new inventions. Now look how far we've come with the internet. And so what I think is a potential for what's going on in our current place or what time it is on the earth, I think that the Kali Yuga centralized power structure that uses fear and coercion is utilizing Dvarpara Yuga technologies, the, knowledges, the knowledge of the electricities, the chakras, and etheric energy to build and establish a worldwide techn technocratic control grid. And so the tr it's important to see the ages as transitioning in kind of overlapping periods of time. There can be cataclysms that mark changes, but it's not a direct on-off switch. So I think that the old systems of power that were common in the Kali Yuga and for example, like in Rome, throwing people to the, throwing pagans to the lions or throwing Christians to the lions, these brutal societies, their lineages and throughout Europe, these families, these monarchies that have hold, been holding power throughout Kali Yuga, they're still around and they want to maintain power. And so their ethics about going about holding power is still around. There's still remnants of the Kali Yuga with us. But to their clever credit, are using the Dvarpara Yuga technologies to maintain their power. And this growth in consciousness, this expansion in the abilities of people, these technologies are said to promote those things, to promote widespread equality, freedom of thought, material abundance, justice, having a higher, a higher developed uh, human being. These are things that people are working towards. The question is, how are we working towards that? Because the Kali Yuga centralized power structure that built these technologies, technologies through projects over the last century and a half are saying they are for these ideals, but in reality, they are, their motivation is for more precise control over human energy and the actual restriction of human freedom of spir and spiritual growth. The reason why they are, have a different, in a different intention than when they say is because they want to maintain their power and you can't have people who are empowered in their own spiritual development and still and, and, and control those people at the same time. So I think that there is a, a consciousness battle happening between the old Kali Yuga system that's fighting to maintain its ages, its, um, its uh, centuries old power as the age changes, but eventually they're not going to be able to rule with the same Kali Yuga coercion and methods that they've used. So. Gradually, as we move into as we move into Dvarpara Yuga, the electrical area, are we going to have a balance of technology and nature, the use of electrical technologies with our relationship with the creation? Because the merging of technologies into the human body is a way to control the human body. It's not a there's an imbalance if you if you merge yourself into a technology in that sense, an artificial technology. We need to be in balance with what we make as instruments and what the natural technologies are that we have our, at our disposal, such as our chakras or our, our um, abilities to be, to, to self-realize and to grow in, in spiritual consciousness. So although this presentation was a bit long, I wanted to, to give just a basic framework for how the, the cycle of ages works and the important main points for how it's a, it's a material and spiritual process that the Vedas are giving us, and as well as to just give some, some basic general overviews on when certain cultures could have existed, but in the context of how that yuga was present, uh, giving what potential that yuga was giving to these civilizations.